Welcome back. It's uh, delightful to be here. Uh, my name is Mihir Desai, and uh, I thought I would just begin by telling you a little bit about myself, and then we'll dive into this talk. Um, so uh, I confess to a little bit of a surprise when Scott asked me uh, to do this. I was obviously delighted to do it, given who you all are and given who Scott is. Um, but you know, it, uh, you know, for a long time toiling in these waters on tax, it's typically not one with things of as kind of the hot topic. Um, but it has become a hot topic. And so um, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts with you about things that have been going on recently and where this is headed. Um, many of you will have heard of inversions. And many of you will, some of you may have worked on an inversion. And, but I'm going to try to expand it out to talk not just about these transactions, but uh, talk about why I think they're happening, what the future is, and then even more broadly about and this is going to be a little bit of a stretch, but more broadly about what's going on in corporate finance in leading companies today. So it's a fairly ambitious talk. When I was thinking about this uh, in the last couple of days, I thought to myself, this is going to be great for me because I get to experiment with you all with some new ideas. Um, and I hope it's going to be great for you, but I really would love your feedback on these ideas and the degree to which they make sense or don't make sense. Okay. Briefly about myself, I teach at the business school uh, and at the law school, and this semester, in fact, I'm for the first time uh, teaching kind of a bread and butter uh, law school class, which has been great fun. I'm an economist by training. I'm teaching tax law, and so it's just been an enormous amount of fun. And so uh, I try to span both those things, but originally, and by nature, I'm an economist. And some of the ideas I'll share with you are kind of guided by that perspective, uh, as you'll see shortly. So the title of the talk is Inversions, the Future of the Corporate Tax. Those, teams, those two might seem connected. And then what may not seem connected is the third piece, which is what I'm going to try to label, and you can tell me if I get away with it or not, uh, kind of a new era of financial engineering. I think inversions are a piece of it. I think there's a broader phenomenon going on, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm going to focus on one piece of that in addition to inversions that I'll talk about in a second. So that's roughly the story. I would be delighted to hear from you. I'd be delighted to get you to interrupt me. I'd like nothing more, so please do uh, along the way. So, um, you know, broadly, what's the motivation? So what has become clear in the last year or two is that uh, taxes are now playing a very critical role in the broader market for corporate control. And so we've seen a number of transactions that are uh, in large part, have at least have a large dimension to which is taxation. And you know, 20 years ago, I think people thought that taxes were something that you fixed after doing the thing you wanted to do anyway. And now it is, seems more and more clear that it's becoming pivotal. And the most recent example of that is uh, the M&A market. And so specifically, uh, if you think about recent deals, uh, consummated deals, but also unconsummated deals like Pfizer, AstraZeneca, but certainly Covidian Medtronic and a whole host of them, they feature this aspect. And I'll be more specific about what we mean by that in a second. You know, you might even think more broadly uh, about this, which is if you think about the main corporate financing puzzles of today, for example, why is there so much cash on corporate balance sheets? A big chunk of that is about tax. And of course, is that a bunch of that cash is offshore. And that again is a cash a tax story. So we're seeing taxation really becoming a first order effect in financing decisions, the market for corporate control more broadly. So the question is, well, what does that mean for the future of the corporate tax? The first question is, why are we seeing this? Why are we seeing these things happen? And what is going to happen to them? And how should we think about them? Second thing is, you know, what would meaningful reform look like? And where might we be headed? What has the rest of the world done, non-US? And what should we be doing? And I know it's always aspirational in the current legislative environment to think about what we should be doing. But we'll try to be aspirational and think about what might actually work. And then here's the real stretch, and this is where you have to tell me if it's a bridge too far or not, is, well, actually, uh, there's something going on here. And that something is something that, again, is called the new era of financial engineering, which is increased attention in corporate finance within companies with respect to rearranging claims on the right-hand side of balance sheets. So that's what I'm going to try to label a new era of financial engineering. I think inversions are one example of that. What do I mean by that? Paying particular attention to the right-hand side of the balance sheet. We usually think about value being created on the left-hand side of a balance sheet with assets. Of course, financial engineering is the intuition that, no, there's actually going to be value created by operating on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. And inversions are surely one example of that. 
said another way, one of the claimants on a pre-tax cash flows for corporations is our governments. And so if we think about rearranging those claims, that's one way to think about it. I think there's a second rearranging that's happening that's even larger. And that is going to be something I call um, the slow motion LBO. And I'll talk about what that means, but it's a very, I think, general phenomenon that's happening, which is a rearranging of claims, again, on the right-hand side of the balance sheet. Those are two aspects of what I'm trying to label the new era of financial engineering. At the end of today, you might say, I don't buy it. I think you'll have a fun ride anyway. Um, but I would love to hear whether you think there's something here and whether these things are knitted together or whether they're just two independent phenomenon that have nothing to do with each other. That's part of what I would love to talk about and hear about. In particular, when we switch to kind of thinking about the slow motion LBO of the US, um, I'm gonna to try to offer up some suggestions for what we can do about it, and you can tell me whether they make sense, whether you have other ideas, or whether we should even be worried about this problem at all, okay? So in a way, these are two somewhat separate talks, but I'm gonna to try to knit them together um, and have um, you believe that they're kind of of a piece of part of a, part of a whole. Okay, so that's the motivation, broadly speaking, and again, feel free to interrupt me. We're gonna to try to figure out what these inversions are we're gonna to try to understand why they're happening. And then I wanna to try to focus on why they're happening in a broader way, which is I think these are a reflection of some secular trends. And one of the reasons to do that kind of diagnosis is because once we understand why they're happening, then we can understand what to do about them conceivably. We'll talk about what actually has been done. So uh, you know, one of the big uh, tremors in the M&A market was the September 22nd notice that came out by um, the Secretary of the Treasury which tried to stop things. And you know we can talk about how effective that was. But the more important question is gonna be what should we be doing and what are the consequences of what we chose to do in that particular setting? Then I'm gonna talk about maybe what we should be doing. Arguably, uh, you, you know, and I'm not a political prognosticator, but conditional on there being any efforts uh, on tax reform, the corporate tax is the most likely candidate. We have both sides suggesting that it's important, it's interesting, we have plans, and I'm not one to suggest things will happen, but if something does happen, this will be it. And uh, the question will be, what should it look like and how should we think about it, and what are the consequences of that? And then I'm gonna link to this idea of a larger era of financial engineering, and I'll take you through the slow motion OBO. That's the outline. Okay, great, so let's get started on inversions. And I, you know, I, uh, I obviously looked at your profiles and I, you know, I, it's entirely conceivable. I know there's at least one tax person in the group um, and there are people who have worked on M&A and transactions. So I would love to hear uh, your perspectives on these transactions if you've seen them. So first question is what are the inversions and what is going on? So um, let's start at the beginning. And first thing we should note is there's really, this is really a long running phenomenon. It's tempting to think about this as what's going on all of a sudden, all these M&A deals are happening and something crazy has happened. In truth, this has a longer history and that history is instructive. So the first way to think about this is there's an early phase of this. And that phase was through the 80s and 90s and into the early 2000s. And that's what we might call a pure inversion. And in fact, recent transactions are bastardized versions of those transactions. <laughs> so what is a pure inversion? Well, a pure inversion, unsurprisingly, is an inversion of the corporate structure that I undertake by myself. I don't do it with anyone else. It's a self-inversion. So what does that mean? Classic transactions like this include uh, McDermott, Stanley Works, a bunch of these were contemplated. And what does that mean by I do it myself mean? I create a foreign holding company on top of myself and I sell myself into that. That's a self-inversion. And so I don't need any partner. I don't need AstraZeneca or any domiciled entity outside. I create that foreign domiciled entity. I put it on top of myself. That's an inversion. It's an inversion. Why is it called an inversion or alternatively an expatriation? But the inversion is because I'm inverting the usual corporate structure. I'm taking a foreign subsidiary and I'm putting that foreign subsidiary on top. So I'm inverting it and I'm expatriating because I'm giving up my citizenship in the process. And we'll talk about exactly what those motivations are. Those are self-inversions. Those are the classic transactions. Those are from the 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Um, and they were concentrated in certain industries. Uh, there was a lot of oil and gas. Uh, There's a lot of reinsurance that happened at that time. Um, those were kind of concentrated in those areas. It became more mainstream with Stanley Works, which uh, is a you know, mainstream company. And it's interesting to think about why Stanley Works did this. Stanley Works makes hammers and garage doors and 
you know, things like that. So not necessarily somebody we would think of as having a lot of offshore income, which might guide you to do this. And so what ended up happening to Stanley Works in the early 2000s was they found themselves competing with Cooper Industries, which is also a company that makes hammers and garage doors and things like that. And they found themselves competing with them, both in the US and offshore, and finding themselves at some notion of a disadvantage. And so what they did uh, is they attempted an inversion. And that was the last attempted inversion of that first wave was Stanley Works. You can imagine what happens in the post 9-11 environment. You might recall this, uh, which is you say you're leaving the United States for uh, Bermuda uh, as Stanley Works, and uh, all hell breaks loose. And so you're called a Benedict Arnold by our then senator. Uh, from Massachusetts, uh, and a variety of things happened that ends up the Attorney General from Connecticut, I think, I think who's now the governor of Connecticut, uh, goes after you. Richard Blumenthal is, oh, sorry. Sorry, I, I, okay, that's, I had confused that, so I thought he was the governor. Okay, so the senator um, from Connecticut uh, calls them a Benedict, no, sorry, Kerry calls them Benedict Arnold, and uh, Blumenthal uh, goes after them in a variety of ways. There's threats about defense contracts being limited to them. And in short, the transaction gets scuttled. That's the last self-inversion that we saw. And what happened after that is legislation, anti-inversion legislation. And anti-inversion legislation effectively said, you can't do this. And what does I mean when I say you can't do this? You can't do it in the following sense. If you affect a transaction like that, the tax benefits that might be associated with that would be nullified. Okay, so that opens up a Pandora's box that we are continuing to see the consequences of. So what's the Pandora's box there? Well, the Pandora's box there is, how do I draw a line between a self-inversion and Dan's company buying me? Now, the self-inversion is I create this thing and it's on top of me, but Dan is also just a foreign company and he may wanna buy me. So now we have to draw a line between that. Okay, and so we start with this line drawing exercise and that line drawing exercise happens with our relative sizes. So you're puny, I'm big, that's not allowed. You're big, I'm small, that's okay. Okay, so that's the 2004 legislation. And we actually kind of see it in some sense be effective, which is we stop seeing these transactions, at least in a meaningful sense of the world. Now, by the way, I should also say there's also like a financial crisis during that period, and a lot of things we just see a lot less. So <laughs> uh, I will say the exception to that is companies like Aon. And Aon found a way through this um, by effectively saying, I'm doing a self-inversion, but under the 2004 law, I'm allowed to. Why? I actually have a lot of activity in that foreign country, which in this case was the UK. So I'm redomiciling to the UK, but it's genuine because I got real UK business. And Aon, as you can imagine, has a lot of, uh, has a lot of UK business, just given the nature of the insurance market. So we, that's kind of a period of decreased activity with some final self-inversions based on just effectively saying, I really am, I got a big substantial tie to the UK and I can do it. What have we seen more recently? Um, more recently is what is you know, now called an inversion, but is really the M&A market responding to this. And so what does the M&A responding, market responding to this mean? Well, all the little Dans grew up and they became big companies, and some of them were engineered to become big companies with the strategy of coming after what had historically been larger companies than they were. And so we saw, in some ways, you can think about this as a supply response. You know, there was a shock, and now there's a supply response, which is we have little companies grow into big companies, and they start doing things that we would have uh, previously not allowed them to do. Just to be specific, they become of a size where they can take over US companies, or at least be not 5%, but 20, 25, 30%. And we get over this initial notion. The 2004 notion was, you're small relative to me if you're 20% and I'm 80% of value. Well, now you've gotten bigger, okay? So what do we start to see? We start to see a variety of transactions. The most, you know, depending on your choice, uh, there are a number of prominent ones. There's Shire, AbbVie, which was tried, Medtronic, Covidian. Pfizer, AstraZeneca is the one that really blew the top off things just because of who Pfizer is and because of the relative size of these transactions. And so that is the one that really generated interest. Um, but just to be clear, this is now abutting the market for corporate control, right? So now we are in genuine M&A transactions, which 
certainly to listen to the people who undertake them, don't have tax as a primary motivation. Having said that, they are redomiciling transactions. So Pfizer would propose to buy AstraZeneca, and oh, by the way, we will be redomiciling to the UK, which, uh, of course, uh, might not be something you would have thought, given their relative sizes and other consequences. I should say the other characteristic transaction way back when, and it gives you a sense of how important this was, Daimler-Chrysler is kind of a canonical transaction. Uh, Daimler-Chrysler is way back when, uh, relatively equal size. And again, at that time, the question was, where do you domicile Daimler-Chrysler? And the answer became not the US, and for the reasons that we'll talk about in a second. So this has been percolating up for a long time, and these most recent transactions are very large, and they are, um, interestingly, uh, you know, first amongst very global companies and very technologically sophisticated companies. So these are the best life sciences companies. Um, you have some activity in the semiconductor uh, market, even Tokyo Electron and Applied Materials. They're, this is a wide phenomenon that's happening across a lot of places. And I'd be interested in your experience on this, but I think a lot of corporations have done the calculation of what an inversion would mean for them uh, in a variety of ways. And I certainly know from the tax folks at corporations that that's the case. They've done that number. They crunched those numbers, and they've figured out how valuable conceivably it is to them. So why are they doing it, and um, you know what, uh, what did we do about it? So as I said, in 2004, we passed this legislation. And more recently, uh, for a long time, we didn't think we were going to do anything. Jack Lew said there was nothing to be done. He subsequently changed his mind, and then he subsequently issued these regulations, or this notice, which is actually quite a powerful notice. So just so we think about this a little bit more, the question is, what are they doing, and what is actually at stake for them, and why is this becoming so important? So first is, um, why, what, are, what are the specific motivations involved here? So there's really three. And this is obviously a complex phenomenon, but it's important to be simple-minded and just kind of think about what the real motivations are. And, and the first motivation is uh, your future foreign earnings are, if you're a U.S. corporation, going to be subject to U.S. tax because we run a worldwide regime. So the first and primary motivation is I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to do that uh, for a variety of reasons, but that worldwide system is one that I can get out from if I do an inversion. That's actually subject to what happened on September 22nd. We can talk about how that became true or not true, but that would be the first motivation. Okay? The second motivation is um, there's actually a ton of offshore cash. So how large is offshore cash? Uh, you know, you can look at a bunch of different numbers. The Apple numbers are public. Apple has about 170 billion in cash. It's like an astronomic just number just by itself. Um, but 110 of that is in Ireland, and they've been quite clear that it's in Ireland, and they are unabashed about it being in Ireland. So when Tim Cook testified before, um, I'm not sure if it's Carl Levin or Sandy Levin. I always get confused. But Behind, before one of the 11 committees, uh, he was quite clear, which is I have $110 billion in Ireland, and that's just what I'm doing. So now I think to myself, just to be clear, why is it offshore? And the answer is it's offshore because the way the worldwide system works is I tax you upon repatriation. So now we have a ton of offshore cash. How big is it? In aggregate, total corporate cash is at an all-time high, something like $3 trillion. Never been as high a fraction of total assets. Of that amount, how much is offshore? Hard to know entirely, but roughly two of the three. So this is kind of now becoming a first order issue in corporate financing patterns. And so we see a ton of cash offshore. Well, wouldn't it be nice if I could access that offshore cash um, in a tax-free way? One other just you know, point on this, which is worth thinking about. The other thing we did in 04, just to make things even more fun, is we passed the American Jobs Creation Act, which was a one-time, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, repatriation tax holiday. By one time, I mean you can bring the cash home one time only, but then we'll never do it again. And of course, as with every tax holiday, it engenders the expectation of the next tax holiday. <laughs> and so the response to that subsequent to 2004 has been the accumulation of a ton of cash offshore in anticipation of that next holiday. So, um, so that offshore cash is a big piece of what is happening here. And then the third piece of what is happening here is what's known as earning stripping, which is a way of saying, uh, I want to get income out of the US. I'm taking the US base and I'm stripping it. And by stripping it, I mean I'm going to reallocate that income out of the US and 
to offshore jurisdictions. And so uh, that would be the third piece of this. Now, just to be clear, these motivations are going to be different for different transactions. One notable example would be Walgreen, Wal Walgreens, uh, which of course is a retail pharmacy which was engaged in a transaction with Boots. There, it's hard to think about it as being about offshore cash because Walgreens doesn't have a lot of offshore cash uh, and it doesn't have worldwide operations of the significance of, let's say, Medtronic or Covidian. There, it, conceivably, it's a little bit more about earnings stripping. And so these motivations are very distinct as opposed to Medtronic Covidian where it's clear Medtronic has 10, I think, at least billion dollars in offshore cash. There, getting that tax-free is a big piece of the savings. And then finally, when you actually have lots of future foreign growth, that first motivation is going to play very, very largely. Okay, that's roughly speaking what's going on with these transactions and what's driving these transactions. I should pause if anybody wants to. Yes, James, Jim. Absolutely. So uh, that's a great question. So the first one would be, let's just focus on one company, GE. So GE makes money around the world. And increasingly, they make money offshore, meaning foreign growth is higher than US growth, and foreign operations are more profitable than US operations. So number one is, I'm making money in Germany, I'm making money in Brazil, I'm making money in China. The worldwide system of the US tries to tax that, number one. The second piece of it is, and this is, this is the elaboration that's important, when I compete in those markets, I'm going up against Siemens. And Siemens, when they're getting their profits in China and Germany and Brazil, they're not taxed by the German government. So what is that consequence of that for GE? So one version of this is, well, wait a second. Now, I'm competing with Siemens in China. Who's going to win that transaction? So that's number one. Number three, sorry, it's not numbered, but the third bullet point is earnings stripping, which is I have income in the US. Why? Because I make money in the US. Uh, the U.S. has a high rate. I want that income out of the U.S. So I reallocate it outside the U.S. What does that mean? That means I take some intellectual property, I put it in Ireland, I price it. Actually, more likely, I do intercompany debt. I do intercompany debt, which is a way of saying I borrow and I make uh, the U.S. subsidiary pay interest uh, to uh, an offshore subsidiary, and I strip the U.S. base. Are we okay with that? So, you know, that's roughly what is happening in terms of the tax motivations for these transactions. And so then the question becomes, well, and I should just say, well, maybe I'll return to this, which is, you know, what should we be doing? Is the worldwide system right? And I'll come back and talk about that in a second. Um, so why is it happening? So I think there's three things to think about when you think about why this is happening. And I think diagnosis is critical if you want to think about what to do about it. So the first thing is, um, the worldwide system is a first order effect on this, right? So we run a worldwide system, and that worldwide system, not just that we run a worldwide system, but we're increasingly the only people who run a worldwide system. So that worldwide system puts pressure on corporations when they're competing, and because of the nature of the deferral and repatriation, it puts pressure on all this offshore cash that is building up. So that's number one. Number two, the rate. Uh, the rate is increasingly very out of sync with where the rest of the world is. So the US rate is considerably higher than our comparable countries. We haven't had major corporate tax reform since 1986. At the time in 1986, we were kind of middle of the pack, uh, and now the rest of the world has moved and moved in very significant ways. So if you follow the UK, that's maybe the most prominent example of this, um, which is the UK has cut its rate, and by the way, moved away from worldwide, and by the way, because their companies were leaving. So if you go back a few years and think about the origins of the UK tax reforms, which have been enormous, it is because uh, WPP uh, and Shire left. There were conversations about GSK you know, potentially leaving. And so that made the administration there change. So the rate is high relative to the rest of the world. What does that do? That makes the worldwide system all the more difficult. That makes offshore cash all the more difficult that makes earnings stripping all the more valuable, right? So that's kind of what's been driving those sets of things. And then the final thing I just want to make, I think it's interesting, which is the asymmetric efforts on earnings stripping. 
And what do I mean by that? I mean that effectively, here's what we know, which is we know that foreign multinational firms make very little money in the US. So just to be clear, what I mean by that, you know, just, again, to pick on one company, Siemens, just as an example, doesn't make a lot of money in the US. And then the question is why? And there's two, at least two explanations for that. The first explanation is it's really hard, sorry? Well, one explanation is they've gotten very good at stripping their income out of the US. And they are able to do things that we might not, the, the GE who's trying to strip their income out of the US perhaps as well, may not be able to do, okay? By the way, there's a second interpretation, which is it's really hard to make money in the US, which could be true also, you know, which is it's really a competitive market and you just have a hard time making money. The empirical fact is they don't make much money. The explanation one is they've got an expert at stripping out the income. And fact number two, well, alternative number two is it's just really hard. And in particular, it's maybe asymmetrically easy for them to do this because their home countries aren't really policing it in the same way that ours are. So we have a set of thin capitalization rules associated with 163J, which try to get at this. So there's a sense in which people feel things are asymmetric, which is it's better to be foreign owned and operate in the US than it is to be US owned and operate in the US because your ability to do these things is different. So that's the third thing to think about, about the US system that's driving this. So that's a broad set of things that are going on, the worldwide system, the rate, and um, I think finally this asymmetric effort on earnings stripping is driving these things. The second big set of things is the rest of the world just moved, and not just the rest of the world, but like big com countries that we think of ourselves as being comparable to, namely the UK and Japan. So the UK moved to worldwide and they cut their rate to now 21 or 20%. 20 that's a massive move. Now that's important for several reasons. Japan also moved uh, to world, sorry, to a, the alternative to worldwide, which is territorial. I just tax the income that's in my, um, within my territory. Um, and the rate reduction is supposed to be the next part of Abenomics. The UK is particularly important because it is a home to very serious companies. And because it is the home to very serious companies, it has a number of legitimate partners for US companies to partner with. So that, I think, was another kind of big change here. It's, it's interesting just as a highlight on this, which is the UK reformed uh, in part because people were threatening to leave, but in part because uh, the government really thought it was important to have them stay which is not quite the policy response we see here, and I'll come back and talk about that. So the third thing here is, and I just wanna highlight this, is you might say, well, there's policy changes here, policy changes there, but you know, the really underlying driver of this, and the reason why this is here to say, and the reason why these transactions have gotten so large, is because there are secular trends that are driving these transactions. And I'll just point to three, um, but I, I think you should come away feeling like, you know, this is not a little blip, like this is the future of the world because this is the way things are going. So what, what are those three secular trends that are worth highlighting? The first is, you know, again, going back to that GE example, we see more growth abroad than we see domestically. So this problem is only gonna get more acute, which is foreign operations are growing in importance relative to domestic operations, and that's just gonna continue to be the case, um, especially in emerging markets. The second thing, and it's a perhaps a little more subtle point, which is, we rely more on intangible assets and the mobility of activity and the mobility of assets has just increased incredibly. So uh, if it's all factories, moving stuff around is hard. Uh, if it's all patents, moving stuff around is relatively easy or cheaper. So this is something which is a secular change and it makes income reallocation, it makes mobility completely different. And then the third thing I just wanted to highlight and I just wanted to show you some slides about is what I'm gonna to try to label as decentering, which is to try, to try to understand what's happening to headquarter functions. I think the, th the first two are kind of broadly lumped together in globalization. A lot of foreign growth, a lot of mobility, that's globalization. The third, I think, is an underappreciated uh, idea, which is that firms have figured out different ways of organizing themselves than they ever did before. And so I'll walk you through this relatively quickly. It's gonna have implications you know, for how we think about a, a tax system as well. So here's just a quick way to understand the last 40 years of global operations. And it's a simple picture, but I think it's useful, a way to think about it. So you go back 30, 40 years, and what are firms doing abroad? And the answer is, they're basically replicating themselves. 
Okay, so what do I mean by that? So you have a US multinational firm, it's servicing US customers, it wants to access Austrian customers, Brazilian customers, Canadian customers. How do they do that? They set up subsidiaries around the world. They replicate themselves. It's a traditional notion of offshoring, okay? Fantastic game, it got played through the 60s and 80s. One of the reasons it got played is because you had high tariffs and you had high transport costs. In that world, what do you do? You jump over those tariffs, you avoid those transport costs, and you set up activities abroad. Okay, what happens next? And then the second thing that happens is, um, uh, is kind of specialization and offshoring, you know, which is a way of saying, well, wait a second, now maybe I should be doing things, the right things in different places. So in particular, I'm gonna think about doing all my engineering perhaps in Austria, I'm gonna do all my manufacturing in Brazil, I'm gonna do all my assembly in China. That's kind of what's called vertical disintegration, take the supply chain, move it all around the world. That's the second piece of this. And that's something which people have done repeatedly. It has a great advantage over this, which is this is inter terribly capital inefficient. You're replicating yourself around the world. That's crazy. Why would you want to do that? And so the answer is, well, let's specialize and let's take the supply chain and move it everywhere. And so that's what the second one is. And then the final step, of course, is once we do that, we realize we don't need to own everything. And so we outsource big functions here, right? Okay, so that's what's happened. And then the question is, what happens, what's happening now? And I think the answer is the same things that drove these changes are happening with even more force and they're happening with headquarters. And so the point that I wanna to try to make here is the next step in this process is the thing that you might've thought was immutable and wasn't gonna change, which is where a headquarters is. People have figured out how to split up and just move. And that's uh, labeled here as kind of decentering. So what does that mean? So you take a headquarters and you split it up. And you know, I think, um, this is really what you're seeing, and I think it's a way to understand what you're seeing. So what is a headquarters? And you think hard about it. These things is, used to be co-located in one place. They no longer need to be co-located, and you can split them up and have maximized value across those different things. So you need a financial home, obviously for public companies primarily. Uh, you need a legal home, and then you need a place for people to sit. Um, and those things historically were co-located and now no longer are. So just to give you a couple of examples of this, there are many now. Um, so one example of this would be Genpact, which is a large um, outsourcing company that used to be part of GE and got spun out because it got, it got too big to be inside GE. Um, so what kind of a company is Genpact? And the answer is first incorporated in Bermuda, now it's in Luxembourg. Where is it listed? And the answer is directly listed in New York. And then where do people sit? And the answer is kind of all over the place. So very hard to identify this kind of a company with any particular jurisdiction in any unified way. And so here, this is, I think is just part and parcel of what we're seeing. We're seeing people get very aggressive about splitting this up in different ways. There are myriad examples of this. Um, I'll give you a couple of recent ones. So, you know, that are perhaps uh, fun and you know, perhaps some people were involved in. So if you think about, uh, Samsonite, last year goes public. Where does Samsonite go public? Where would you go public if you were Samsonite? Large luggage company. Prada also goes public last year. Both go public in Hong Kong. Kind of independent of their operations, <laughs> independent of where their legal home is, but a fantastic advertising piece of the puzzle for the Asian market. And you see this with a dumb bunch of different companies, which is companies saying, well, I want to be, for example, in the US for my financial home. Why? Equity markets here are deeper, price discovery is better, incentive compensation is better, I can actually have real underlying stock as opposed to some phantom stock, so I want to be in the US. I'll give you another example, which is Alcon. Alcon, uh, Alcon was the ophthalmological subsidiary of Nestle. And uh, Nestle wanted to take Alcon um, public. They thought about doing it in Zurich, which is where Nestle is listed. And the labor, the skilled labor, the managerial talent inside Alcon said, no, I have to attract talent. I can't do that with phantom stock on some Zurich operation. That doesn't work for me. I need real stock options. 
So Alcon becomes Alcon Inc. and listed in New York, except it isn't. It's actually Alcon Age, and it retains a Swiss identity because it's wonderful to be Swiss for all, lots of different reasons. Um, and then, of course, the home for managerial talent is a third piece of the puzzle. So the point here is to say that people have figured out that the same forces that drove you towards uh, specialization and reallocations around the world is now happening with headquarters, and it's happening pretty fast, and it isn't going to change. And so what do I mean by that? The underlying logics for why this is happening are secular trends. So in particular, you can do this with a great deal of ease. Uh, you actually have jurisdictions who are competing for these specific pieces of the puzzle. And those jurisdictions are getting really good at competing for that specific piece of the puzzle. And so that's certainly not going to stop. Uh, talent is becoming more and more powerful. And so they're dictating where they sit. And so they don't necessarily want to be co-located in any natural way with other uh, pieces of the puzzle. And then, of course, you have uh, shareholders and lenders that are driving this. One interesting piece of the inversion story is the role of hedge funds in stimulating that entire trend. Um, you know, Valiant Allergan is a key example of that. Uh, Valiant is a really interesting company. In part, at least some people might characterize it as having grown up for these specific purposes, um, you know, to take over other companies and effectively redomicile them in that function. And of course, a number of funds have been very, very involved in doing that. So once you have an advocacy group for these trends, it only picks up and accelerates maybe even more and more. Okay, so, and just by the way, to finish this off, you know, how do you make these decisions? And the answer is, you know, in some ways really straightforward. Your legal home is a place which is gonna dictate tax obligations, and you have a number of jurisdictions that compete on that now, not just the UK and Japan, but obviously Bermuda and Luxembourg and everywhere. Um, and on financial home, you want a place with price discovery, you want incentive compensation, you want investor protections. Uh, used to be the days when ADRs or GDRs would get you there. Now direct listings are gonna become, I think, even more common. And then, of course, where people sit is now splintered, and you will see uh, sea level folks in different places, and they want to be proximate to uh, supply pools, labor pools, uh, sometimes financial markets, and you see that happening in a variety of different ways. All of this is a way of saying once this takes hold and continues with the force that I think is happening, you can say you know, goodbye to trying to tie people to particular jurisdictions in any meaningful sense. Uh, because they figured out how to actually splinter it in a very aggressive way across these. So that's a little bit of what's happening here. And again, this is all in the spirit of why is this happening? And these are all secular things uh, that are happening in a very, I think, systematic and continued way. Okay, so what did we do about it and what should we do about it and how do we think about it? Here's a complete digression that I just, if anybody has any interesting thoughts about, I would love to hear. The fascinating thing to me was the rhetoric 10 years ago and the rhetoric this summer was, um, was very clear about economic patriotism. And so the president suggested this, Jack Lew suggested this, and uh, the question is, what does that mean? What does economic patriotism mean? Now, it's been thrown out there as a reason for why we should not have these transactions. And clearly, um, the way that people have formulated this is to think about this as what are the duties of corporations to countries? So that's what economic patriotism has meant when people have said, we need our corporations to be, you know, why are they doing these things? We need them to be patriotic. And I don't think I'm being hyperbolic. This was the language that was used this summer as well as, as, well as in the fall. And so, the question I have is, is that's a useful way to think about the world? Uh, and I guess there's, and I'd be love to hear your thoughts about this, because you know, in effect, what is happening is these inversions um, are viewed as disloyalty and as, are viewed as unpatriotic. So there's, I think, I guess I wanted to say two things about this and run this past you all, which is the first thing to say about this is, um, you know, First off, in a world of decentering, where you see people doing this, it's just not clear what it means to suggest that companies have homes. And so what do I mean by that? Shareholder bases are global. Lender bases are global. Managerial talent pools are global. Product markets are global. And so how do I uniquely associate a company with a country in that setting? 
Now, one answer to say that is, well, it's where you're incorporated, and it's where you grew up. And maybe that's the right answer, which is if you grew up in the U.S., you should be patriotic to the U.S. What does patriotic mean in this setting? Well, it means that you should stay true. I think it's what it means, is you should stay true to the U.S. So first of all, I'm just curious, does that, does that seem like an appealing formulation to you? Or what do you think that misses? Because this was kind of the political rhetoric over your, at least some of your clients, or your activities. Well, it's not relevant. It's not relevant because our share owners don't think it's relevant. Uh, we may think it's relevant. And, and, you know, we have many corporations now that are incorporated in the U.S. with the vast majority of your employees and sales. Your activities are actually offshore. Yeah. offshore. But you are at a competitive disadvantage. You are clearly put at a competitive disadvantage on many fronts. So do you, let me, let me just push you though. So are you, so do you have a loyalty to the U.S. in that setting? I personally do. No, I'm sorry. No, 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 no but as a senior leader of a company, I do. Exactly. The company does, our share owners don't. And so what do you do in response to that? Um, I, I have a particular defense to it, because we have defense business, so you can, you can wave the flag there, but I mean, Okay, right, so the defense business is special. special. Yeah, yeah, that's clear. Right. 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 It's very hard. It's very hard to resist the argument of why, you know, why are you subjecting yourself to this 35% corporate tax and you have all this cash deferred offshore when your competitors are out yeah. claiming your pot. Yeah. And the alternative logic is you benefited from a variety of things in the United States and you should be true to the United States. Right. I think, yeah, sorry, John, go ahead. No, I mean, uh, you know, I, I think that's you what know, we said before. I mean, you don't just, this was created vacuum that was many you know, companies that grew up here and the benefits of, these, of, of this country have you know, financing this country. So there, there is a certain amount of aspect. Forget about the defense. Forget about the defense because that's yeah. special. Yeah. But you know, and, and, and if a large part of the customer base may be here. Now maybe different if they're not here and it's, it's foreign. But, yeah. but uh, you know the answer isn't always I don't think for the long term health of I'd like to say we're in a global world. It'd be nice to get one global government and we all. But we don't. But we don't. So we live in nation states. And it's, sometimes it's in the bet. There's other longer term interests that may be in the national good, which in the long run is good for the companies and the employees and, and yeah. the country itself. The answer just may not, is it run to the jurisdiction with the lowest tax rate and move, move over there? The answer may be we need reform here. And Absolutely. Unfortunately, right. And we'll talk about reform here, here, but people have been talking about reform for a while. I, I get that, and, and maybe force it on them. Yeah. Maybe the one time. I'm just curious if you get more opinions about how you formulate your loyalties in this setting, because you might have your personal ones, and you might think about a little shareholder base. Go ahead, Sean. Well, I, uh, I'm thinking about what percentage of your shareholders are based in the U.S. and how does that benefit the U.S. So if you are Inverting, offshoring, the company's more profitable, and most of your investor base is in the U.S. Is that a factor to be considered? Yeah. So, Sean, your test for country nationality is specific, my apologies. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, your test for country nationality is the citizenship of shareholders. No, I'm, I'm just suggesting it's a factor that could be. <clears throat> it's only a factor, absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I just think it's partly the reaction. I think that it's you, you define as economic interest. I do think that's the rhetoric, and there's that, that's very strong. But I think there is an element as well of, of artifice, I and mean, the feeling like that there's these transactions that are being done that are that are that are, that are legally sound and are, are permissible, but somehow are seem very bizarre, right? And so you have, and I know that the rate with the tax regulation is a certain percentage. Yeah. Start saying, well, you know, yes, yes, there is a global shareholder basis. Yes, that's true. But if you really look at this particular company, um, actually, a huge percentage of its Businesses in the U.S. a huge percentage of the share. Walgreens would be an example, right? I mean, Walgreens. So you kind of mm -hmm. say it's ludicrous to think that you're you're not a U.S. company. I can understand the desire to do it, but of course that makes sense. Yeah, and there may be good reasons to do it. Right. And what sense is it artificial? I guess I, I see it as you're trying. I think people kind of think about it as I think it's very different if a company grew up in one country and now all of its operations are in another place and to say, well, all of course, seventy percent of them, and to say, well. You're no, you know, we're not problem solved here, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. I think it's it's a little strange to kind of argue that somehow we're being required by this other company. I, I think that's the reactions people have. Yeah. Yes, it's true, it's all true, but I think commonsensically it seems strange. But yeah. I think it's tied to the general unhappiness with 
what people perceive as yeah. machinations in the financial market. Go ahead, John. Yeah. What about the idea that patriotism actually isn't inherent, it has to be earned? And it, looking back and seeing what the country is like for you, not just you know, what, what you And so, what's the application here? Well, I think you need to look at um, what's happened in the past and what the fact that we haven't had any tax reform for so many years in all the other countries in the world. Can <coughs> so, that makes it okay to leave? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Well, forget inversions. I mean, if, if you want to look at economic patriotism, should we, all as large U.S. companies that have these trillions of dollars offshore, should, should we, do we have a, an economic imperative to bring that money back? We should all repatriate that. That's the major job we need. That's the major job we need. We get killed if we get it. Sorry? We would get killed if we get it by our shareholders. I get killed by our shareholders. Absolutely. Yeah, Sean. Right. Uh, there's no question. It's not, you look at any corporate, there's no duty to leave money anywhere. It's due to the shareholders to make money when it's possible. Yeah. And there's no duty in Delaware to make money for Delaware. There's no duty, that's absolutely right. But this is a very powerful rhetoric, right? I mean, when these speeches happened, you know, Walgreens ended up scuttling their boots transaction. So it's working, right? I mean, the rhetoric is working. So that must mean it. I mean, I understand your point, but it's working in some some general sense. It's working. It's the only way it works. If it's in charge, <laughs> if it's in charge, that's absolutely right. In charge, right. there are mutual funds that are going after environmental, social, other things. And then it's in your charge. <laughs> that's the mandate. Absolutely right. right. And in fact, you could go all the way, right? And this, I think, was implicit in your story. You could go all the way and say, well, in fact, in my fiduciary responsibility to my shareholders, I have transactions that are available to me that my competitors are undertaking that are straightforward transactions. Maybe you perceive them as a little artificial, but. I, that's the idea. I, just, I think that people, I mean, maybe they do, but I think that that's part of the political reality. Absolutely right. I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, no, I was just going to say that I think the U.S. accounting firms are also in favor of this, and so it legitimizes, you know, uh, the whole prospect of, uh, of moving the money offshore. Yeah. Well, they're in favor of it. In, I it's worked for them. It's worked for them, right? <laughs> that makes sure you back to Accenture, for example, yeah. is Absolutely true. Yeah, sorry. Well, there, there are obviously so many dimensions of this and so many individual corporate structures, but I would have two concerns about companies moving. First, the, the various articles that talk about the effective tax rate in the U.S. not being 35 percent for many of the companies going there. Absolutely. Uh, and secondly, the apart from the, the absolutely demonstrable tax advantage short run of the move and having access to the cash, what happens to the U.S. governance uh, structure for, for these companies as they are able to choose other countries, which, by the way, haven't done nearly as much. We have followed in, in, in many places, in, in many instances in the U.S., various initiatives from Europe, but the rest of the world is not considered up to the same level of scrutiny and in, in, in times of difficulty, uh, financial difficulty, those governance things help the shareholders and they help, they help the countries. Absolutely right. I think this is a critical point, right? Which is part of what's going on here is there are governance changes that are implicated sometimes by these moves. Sometimes you can contract for the same governance structures, um, but sometimes you are going to enter into a different governance regime and people don't, I think, fully acknowledge what that means. And in fact, if you look at kind of price responses to this stuff, it's interesting to see what happens when companies undertake these transactions. Because two things, you know, one is there's an immediate tax hit to the shareholders, right? Because, and this is a very curious part of these transactions I don't think people understand, which is uh, you immediately subject your shareholders typically to a realization event. So you are in some sense making your shareholders pay a penalty for future earnings, for future tax savings <laughs> on your earnings, which that's a little bit curious. But the more interesting piece is that the price reaction to these transactions varies a lot based on the governance of the firms. So poorly governed firms don't get big pickups from these activities because they're viewed as a little bit suspicious. You know, what are you going to be doing? Where are you going to be doing it? How am I going to monitor you? As opposed to well-governed firms who get a much bigger price pickup. And certainly even in the Valley and Allergan case, people have been questioning what is the governance of the resulting entity for these very reasons. I think the reason to think about this is because I think this is percolating in the water. If you're in Europe at all, you'll see this big time with 
the notion of corporate tax avoidance generally with the Starbucks cases and the Google cases. People are very concerned about this. 